the class is yours. Thank you, Subia. And thank you, Your Excellency, uh, for inviting me to talk about this very fun subject uh, because it's, it's really kind of foundational to what we do in the SCA. Because remember that, you know, when we look at what the SCA, SCA is, um, you know, it's a community of people that are pursuing research um, and recreation of pre 17th century skills, arts, combats, um, and I mean, history is a huge thing. <laughs> so you can look at uh, developing your persona as a way to narrow down the scope of, of things that you, you spend a lot of time on or you learn about, uh, you, have, you have time to learn other things, but having a persona is kind of a starting point uh, in the SCA. They're, they're not really required, but they can um, really add a dimension to your play and, and give you that focus into your research on clothing, on customs, language, naming, um, martial arts, because you know that varied depending on when and where you were. Uh, so, you know, cooking, gardening, you know, Eleanor is a great resource for that. And so it, it really gives you an opportunity to dive into a narrow band. Um, you know, on the other other side, you know, if you if you don't want to be narrowed, you can just sort of pick a medievalish name um, and go from there. So, personas aren't really required, but they they really do help with creating a focus. And you know, most people develop some sort of background story for their for their persona. Um, if you're a gamer and you have developed character sheets, you're probably familiar with the process. You have developed personas before. Um, if you have ever written a novel, uh, you have developed characters before. So it's it's very similar here. In in the SEA, we we don't spend a lot of time speaking for Sufli. Um, <laughs> Some kingdoms, that's a little bit more of a thing, but here in Ontier, uh, we, we tend to speak the way we normally speak. Uh, we don't play parts. Um, you know, our persona uh, is, is somebody who we are, and it just really gives us that focus. So the persona is a fictional person. Generally, we don't pick specific people um, to recreate in the SEA. Some folks have, uh, you know, looked back in their genealogy and pulled in uh, some of their family history. And I forgot to introduce myself. I just realized. <laughs> oh, I'm kind of out of practice on teaching classes via Zoom, apparently. Hi, I'm my Countess Suvia Julia Heriberti. And I am a member of the Order of the Laurel. I have served as princess twice uh, here in the summit. I have been a whole different range of officers, both at the principality level and local branch level. Currently, I am the Terra Pomeria librarian. Uh, we do have a Facebook page and I post fairly regularly, just kind of interesting tidbits that I find out on the web. Uh, that can help people do research, do documentation of that research, and then how to uh, share that at research, because one of the best fun things about doing research is sharing it with people, because the whole reason why, you know, the SEA exists is to learn about this, but also to share it. So I wanted to break and see if there was anyone who had questions at this point. Okay, so we're gonna go ahead. Um, so when we, when we look at the persona, like I said, we don't pick specific individuals um, to, to, to recreate, but you can use people from history to model. Um, you know, a lot of, of people may look if they're interested in, in early or, sorry, you know, mid to high, um, medieval eras, 
you know, folks can look to William Marshall and some of the other people and kind of look to see what they were wearing, what they were doing, what they, you know, what kind of activities did they do? Um, in the SEA, we assume everyone is a noble. Not everyone really plays that role. Um, but, in, you know, we assume that people are uh, lords and ladies, but some personas are middle class, some personas are workers, and it just, it just really depends on what your comfort level is. Um, so we start with that, that fictional person that you want to be. And a really good place to start is pick a time and place. Um, and, and this isn't set in stone. Uh, if you kind of try this persona out and you learn more about that time period and the clothing and, and the things that those people do um, and you find you don't like it, <clears throat> you can pick a different persona. Uh, I have a couple of different personas and I'll talk about my major one here in a little bit, but there's a lot of people who have more than one persona. Um, they might be uh, Norse during the summer camping, but they might be Italian Renaissance uh, in the winter feast season because the, the dresses are prettier. <laughs> and, and so, you know, you can have a lot of fun and you can play with this. Um, and try out different personas. Um, you can make up a story. A lot of people make up a story about themselves. It kind of helps you start to flesh out where and when um, you might want to start researching. Uh, but you don't want to make it convoluted. This, this isn't yoga. <laughs> and keeping it simple to start with I think is really important because you want to kind of make sure you're hitting high points of when and where and who and station in life um, so that you can start to look at what, what that person in that time period would be doing. Um, my persona, um, my persona is Dominus Suvia Filia Heriberti. And I took the name Heriberti because my father's name was Herbert. <laughs> and so uh, I Romanized that, the name um, for, for use in, in my play. So I'm a Merovingian woman of the early seventh century. Um, my family is an old senatorial family, now in service to King Clovis II. And while well, I've been a, a companion to Queen Batilde. So I was married for a time to a relative of Batilde's, a uh, Kentish man who was in service to Ethelbert. Uh, he died in battle and I returned to join Bethilde um, in her abbey at Shells and joined her in a life of quiet complication and service. And, and so that's in a nutshell, my main um, persona. And so that helps me you know, the way I want to dress basically comes from that time period. So the garment that I'm wearing now, this coat, you know, that's, this is a garment of seventh century Merovingia. And it's not as fancy as a queen would wear because I, I haven't been a queen, I have been a princess. So I have expensive embroideries and I have silk in the garment. Um, the, my diadem, is an old, old family heirloom. It's one of the last pieces that, that we have from the heyday of my family when they were uh, senators in Rome. Um, so my family has since married into and out of uh, various Germanic uh, Anglo-Saxons. And so it's just kind of a melting pot but we are part of the bureaucratic administration of the kingdom and my role as seneschal <laughs> at both, at both a local level and at the principality level kind of, kind of feeds into that persona um, because my family would have been uh, one of uh, the, the governmental administrators. One of the things that was really cool about the Merovingian kingdom is they 
basically inherited a functioning Roman territory. And they continued to use the, the Roman uh, apparatchiks. Uh, and so that's why my family, while it was senators from Rome, who after the fall of Rome, uh, moved out to their villas uh, in Francia, and we just continued doing what we do, and that's running a nation. <laughs> so we've just kind of, you know, kind of done that, married in and out of families, and and here we are today. So my story gives me several different cultures that I can play with. Um, first of all, Merovingian um, and Anglo-Saxon. At this time period, it was pre-Christian, early adoption. So I could play with uh, pagan Anglo-Saxon, or I could play with early uh, Christian Anglo-Saxon. Uh, I can also play with early Byzantine. We know that there was a lot of trade, both political and economic with the Byzantine air, um, empire, which was just kind of getting solidified over in Byzantium. Um, and I can also play with some of the remnants of the Roman culture that still existed in uh, the Frankish kingdoms. I've also been looking at doing some Sogdian uh, that's uh, Persian and in that kind of area, uh, mainly because the women wore pants and they use these bright, bright fabrics that are a lot of fun that are just beautiful um, textures and colors and prints and, and different weaves and different things like that. So, you know, your persona gives you a lot of things that you can play with. Um, at the same time, I also have an alternate persona. I don't play it as much um, lately, mainly because I just haven't had time to do this persona justice, let alone a second one. Um, but I started out in the SEA um, as a pirate and my persona was a pirate wench. And then I became princess and realized I should probably a register a name and, and to kind of get a little bit more serious about how I play in the SCA. Um, and so I at first was a 16th century Venetian um, because, oh my gosh, those dresses are so pretty. And I just love all of the handwork that goes into those dresses. But I also like the poetry of the time, the artwork of the time. Um, you know, I'm, kind, I'm learning Italian so that I, when we go to Italy next year, I can kind of, you know, ask where the bathroom is. Um, so that gives me another opportunity to kind of focus um, my interest. You know, my, I've kind of been looking at gardens of that time period because there's more information uh, one of the reasons why I picked uh, the Frankish culture to base my persona on um, was because there wasn't a lot of information in English. There's a lot in German, a lot in French, some in Polish, some in Hungarian, some in Russian, but there wasn't a lot in English. So it was, it was kind of challenging. Um, so, you know, like I said, this, this kind of gives me a lot of things to play with. And, and that's what you know, that we were playing a game. So you want to pick something that you are going to have fun with. And if you're having a hard time picking an era, you know, pick a favorite historical movie that, that happens pre-1700. Um, and I'm going to open this up. Uh, and I'm going to ask you guys some questions now. Um, is, there, is there anybody here that has not set on a persona yet you know feel free to unmute yourself and, and answer we have not set a persona yet because we're just starting off well welcome it's good to see you <laughs> um do you have do you have a favorite time of history um i don't know about time but i'm thinking about going with where the netherlands are now but it's called the low countries but I think he's looking at being. I'm still undecided. He's undecided. Because <laughs> a, a way some people choose their persona is, you know, a movie comes out and that greatly influences the kinds of personas that you see. I mean, after Braveheart, we, we were awash in guilt, um, you know, and, and when Kingdom of Heaven came out, 
you saw a lot more crusader, high medieval kinds of uh, costumes around. So, you know, if you're kind of undecided, think about, yes, Lady Hawk. Oh my God, I love that movie. Um, anyway, so think about a movie that you like. Do you have a favorite historical movie? Uh, last, last time we came up with characters, it was um, based on food, <laughs> to be honest. <laughs> oh my God, I love you guys. That is an excellent way to decide. We like first. Food is a very big part of eventing. Yes, <laughs> you'll fit in very well here. <laughs> <laughs> I love you guys and I need to get to know you. <laughs> um, so what kind of uh, food do you like? Because we like the food. Yeah. So... <laughs> Dates, pineapples, all that stuff. Yeah, well, you know, Persians are, Persians have a great history. Um, you know, if, if you're thinking about Persian um, or Middle Eastern, you can kind of work your way back from the, the Saf Safavids. Safavids? Is that how you pronounce it? I always get mixed up, but, you know, kind of work your way back because, you know, honeyed figs, goat cheese and apricots, pistachios, baklava. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, Persian, Persian women wore trousers. So, you know, you can wear trousers. There's, um, they wear several different layers of long tunics and dresses, but they are wearing trousers underneath it. And have I mentioned baklava? <laughs> yeah. And sherbet. <laughs> and sherbet, oh my gosh, yes, okay. Um, so, and, and Persian clothes are, are really a lot of fun because um, they used, they, they had access to cotton mm. and they had access to glorious silks. And, you know, at some point um, in time, Persians had more uh, Mongol influence in the 14th and 15th century. So you can pull in some of those Mongol influences. If you go back even further, um, you know, how you have more Zoroastrian types of influences. So it just, it just really depends on where you want to land in that. And you don't have to pick a single time period. Uh, they ate figs pretty much all the time. So you can pick any period you like. The other thing I'm thinking is I'm a pretty basic sewer. So I look at the garb too saying, can I make this happen? to feel like I'm doing the full thing, you know, cause I don't want to do all the slashes and things. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Persian is is really easy. It is rectangular construction. Yeah, so Mediterranean foods is a great reason to dress Persian. Um, you know, I've always wanted to do some uh, Egyptian Coptic tunics, the linen with the wool uh, tapestry. Um, you know, it's it's great big garments, and it'll be awesome in the hot summer days. Um, because that's another thing you need to consider. Um, in, in summer here in the Pacific Northwest, it could be a day like today, or it could be, you know, 3000 degrees. Right. <laughs> um, and so picking something that has a lot of linen, a lot of wool, um, you can interchange there. I have a question, but sure, I'm ahead, not currently on. looking for a new persona. Okay. You mentioned that your persona is in service to King Clovis. Mm-hmm. My, How do you reconcile husband, this with your king being Christian? Uh, Clovis was Christian. No, the second no, no, Clovis. Christian Bain. Clovis. Pardon? So Clovis is uh, a historic king uh, in, in the Marin, Merovingian line. He is like, was he the right. first? I understand that Clovis is a historical figure, but here in the SCA, your king is King Christian. How do you reconcile ah, that bit? Yeah. So see, there's there's one of the fun things of the persona. <laughs> my my current real life husband is a knight. Um, and so yes, we are in service to uh, King Christian and Queen Helen. But my persona story is that we were in service to King Clovis and Queen Bethild. Um, and so we just kind of uh, substitute the two. Um, it's, it's kind of, that's, that's where we have the anachronism <laughs> and, and sometimes you just kind of have to roll with it. Um, so what I'm hearing is that Veronese Jimena had better up her heavy fighting game 
and make Clovis a king in order to enhance the authenticity of your experience. I like you. Yes, she does. <laughs> Did you hear that, Clovis? <laughs> okay, so do people have access to a computer? I'm going to be putting up a link here. If I had better internet connection, I'm going to put it into the chat. You can um, also share your screen too. Maybe you pull it up. Yeah, unfortunately, my the Zoom is sucking up the bandwidth, so I'm not able to get sure um, this pulled up. So I I put up a character name generator, um, and so if you can pull that up. And so you can have a choice of choosing some different um, names. And, and this is just a fun exercise. This is, you're not choosing a, uh, a persona or name right now. It's just, uh, just kind of fun and seeing some of the di different names that you can come up with. Um, is anybody planning on being Welsh? <laughs> uh, you hand me all your vowels. <laughs> I'll, I'll take possession of those. <laughs> uh, we do have a friend in uh, the neighboring branch of Mountain's Edge who speaks Welsh and can help you with your, your Welsh names if you need help. Yeah, that's the Welsh is a fun culture to, to play with. Um, it's, it's so ancient. You can go back to, you know, the... Uh, Neolithic and earlier uh, with the Welsh peoples. So anyway, this is just a fun little, you know, I'm just going to hit a random name generator <laughs> kind of thing and just have some fun with it. Um, but when you're when you're starting to look at actually getting into, where's my mouse? There's there's my cursor. Um, when you're when you're actually starting to look for actual names and names that you can register uh, the SCA heraldry page has some excellent resources let me see if I can actually get that one to pull up and I'm going to show you what's going on here pull back up participants so this is the page and as you can see that there are a ton of resources that um, can help you choose your name where you are Pull you over here. Um, help you choose your name there. Uh, from Asia, Byzantium, England, France, like all other, all other places, um, there'll be some kind of information that you can use to figure out a name. Because the most important thing to know about a name in the SCA is you, if you don't choose it for yourself, somebody will stick you with the name and that's what you will be for <laughs> known as. So choose wisely, um, but you can change your name. It, people have done it. I used to be Sophia uh, Matriona della Tempesta when I was mostly doing 16th century Venetian, um, but I officially changed it to Suvia. Um, and I chose Suvia because it was really close to Sophia <laughs> and, and when it confused everyone that, that knew me earlier. Um, so th this is a great one to uh, bookmark uh, so that you can come back to it. And, and so like I said, it's just, it's just a huge, huge number of resources. Yeah, I've been thinking about going looking at Hungarian because apparently my family has some history there. So, you know, you can, you, can, you can spend hours and hours here. Another place um, that uh, is, is kind of interesting to look at, and we'll see if this pulls up. Um, this is a book that you can download that kind of gives you an overview of world cultures. 
uh, you can look, download it as a PDF. It's open format. It's an open textbook. And it kind of, if you just, if you don't know kind of where you want to land, you know, this kind of gives you an overview of, of what the possible ones are. Another, you know, once you start um, kind of narrowing it down, uh, the place I tell people uh, to start looking is Wikipedia. I, I start whenever I have a new sub subject that I'm looking at, I start with Wikipedia because that kind of gives you a real good overview. I may have a PhD, but I still use Wikipedia quite a lot. <laughs> uh, and it, it just really gives you a concise overview of the time and place uh, that you're interested in. Another uh, site that is really good, it's not going to load it for me, it was a real code hog website. Um, I will put it over here, is the Oregon State uh, Study Guides um, for different cultures. So that's a great resource. OSU is just down the road. Um, once things open back up, you can go down there and spend hours upon hours of, of fun and games and studying your, your persona. Uh, U of O has a really good library also, and they have a lot of uh, medieval texts that they put on display every once in a while. So I'm going to break here to see if anyone has any questions. I do have a comment. Wikipedia mm -hmm. is great for an overview, but never cite it if you're going to be using this information elsewhere, such yes. as uh, for uh, your section of sergeantry. There are links in Wikipedia that you can follow to find that information that they're using in that. But are you suggesting for, that Wikipedia is not a good source for, say, Kingdom a and Championship? Exactly. I am saying that. So that does bring up um, another one that I wanted to share. And, and Clovis makes a really good point. Um, you know, you kind of have to be careful of your sources and making sure that they are valid. Um, and to show you how, you know, how I use Wikipedia and, you know, I looked up uh, Batil recently and found a new article that I didn't know about about her. Um, from one of the citations that they used. So I use it just kind of an overview to find out, you know, where they live, when they live, just basic information. And then I can take that information and put it into Google Scholar. And Google Scholar is your friend. So I'm going to put in um, Batil. So she was sainted. Uh, she actually started out as a Kent slave. She was from Kent and uh, actually rose to uh, being queen and the mother of two kings. So Google Scholar um, can take you to various articles. Um, if I spoke French, I could read this. Uh, but what I would do is I would run this through Google Translate. Google Translate is your friend, if you haven't discovered that already. Um, and so I can look at different uh, citations here and, and start to do some research on people around my time period. Um, so Google Scholar is a great place to start, um, you know, especially if you don't have access to like a, a local college library. But your local library, once they open up, can get articles and books for you through interlibrary loan. And, you know, basically, if you want a specific article on from like a, a journal or a magazine or something like that, if you can post it to the library uh, website, the Facebook group, um, we can help run down those uh, various article requests because uh, we have a lot of people that do have academic access to really groovy libraries. I really miss having, having access to the OSU library. So anyway, Google Scholar, it's a great place to start. So there are 
a number of different websites that I wanted to share with you on different ways to develop the, your persona. I'll share the, the chat here. And so one way to approach it is, you know, answering questions. Um, you know, what's your persona's name? Where were you born? What country? Um, you know, you can even, you know, do you have any siblings? It can get down to, you know, that kind of level of detail. You know, what was the stat, like, here's one, you know, what was the status of women among your persona's culture, time and frame, and can they own property and conduct business? Well, it depends on which station in life they are. Um, Queen Bathilde was sold as a slave from Kent into Francia. She was sold into the household of the king and basically rose up through the ranks, caught the eye of the king at some point, <laughs> and became queen. Uh, but she also uh, founded many, many abbeys and monasteries um, during her time as queen. Uh, she amassed great power. And so, you know, getting down to that level of detail of knowing who's who in your time period is also very useful because it can talk about the status of women, um, their economic power, um, cultural power that they have. You know, my family is an old senatorial family, so that comes with a certain amount of status in the society. Um, so these are just a huge number of questions that you can go through. And, you know, it's, it's basically answer these questions for your persona and you'll have it fully fleshed out. Here is another website that you can look at. Luckily, these websites are kind of old school and not really code heavy. Um, so this is a, a, another one that you can kind of look at to get information on how to develop uh, your persona. Um, and I, I like this one, you know, take it for a test drive. Introduce yourself, you know, in meetings as this name and see if it just, if it feels right to you. Uh, and then you can start to flesh out your details. Um, so here is another one. And, you know, I recommend that you just kind of uh, check these different pages out. Uh, there, you know, here's, here's one that, that has some different information than the other ones talking about concerns. Um, you know, it takes time for the SCA people to remember your name. It's, it's actually, I found that having an SCA name separate than your real name is really uh, crucial when you have sort of a commonish uh, first name in, in modern life, because if somebody yells Suvia, there's going to be no other Suvias <laughs> in, the, in the grocery store when my kids were looking for me. Because <laughs> when they yelled mom, you know, there's a thousand moms <laughs> in the store, but I heard Suvia. You know, and you can base it on what kind of garb it, that you want to sew. Um, you know, if you're kind of a new, new sewist, you might pick a culture that has less complicated uh, garments like uh, earlier period, Norse, um, Persian, Middle Eastern, all of those have really simple uh, sewing shapes. It's basically rectangles and triangles. Um, you know, as you go on, you might consider uh, getting better at sewing and, and doing some of the more complicated uh, personas that are later period that have all of that amazing handwork. So eventually what you're going to do, oh, here's a note, here's one. And this is kind of her description of it and, and how to, um, how she goes about it. So I wanted to share these with you, bookmark these pages um, and go check them out. And I'm gonna go back to, back to, back to this one. So eventually you will pick out a name and you will get it what they call registered um, and you will register a device uh, and th that goes through um, let's try this yes on your college of heralds that's what i want 
So eventually you will go to register your name and armory. And so by this time, by the time you're ready for this, you've kind of picked your persona and you have spent some time fleshing it out. And you, if you change your mind, you, you register this name and then you change your mind and you want to register another name, that's perfectly okay. You can change it as often as you want. Uh, but just remember that what you're putting your friends, what you're putting your friends through every time you change your name and <laughs> you have to remember your new name. Um, so, so don't be that guy that changes it at least once a year and then nobody ever knows your name or unless you don't ever want people to know your name. Um, so eventually that <laughs> you will, you'll go in and register uh, your name and then you will register arms and that can be a lot of fun. That's where you have sort of artistic um, license. Uh, you know, in my period um, for my persona, I would not have had heraldry at all. Um, the heraldry that we think of tends to be very high medieval um, and into the Renaissance era. We would have livery, kind of, but again, that's much later after um, my period. So I just kind of picked, picked a, a field of semi of bees because um, bees were really important to the Merovingian peoples and, and just kind of called it good because we didn't have heraldry. But if you're doing something that's more later period, high medieval, then you can really have some fun with your heraldry. Um, you know, there might be a symbol or something that's really important to you. Uh, the top of my arms has a green wavy and I call it green bacony. I don't know what it's called. <laughs> I'm a bad peer. I don't know what it's called. <laughs> in in heraldry speak, uh, I call it green bacony. So it's it's a line of white and green that's kind of wavy um, because bacon is really important uh, to me in my role in, in the SCA and, and in life. You your bacon in, out in for too long if it's turned green. <laughs> yeah. So eventually you will register your name and, and if you have questions about names, the heralds will love to spend time helping you find sources for your name. You can't register names that aren't from that period. Um, so that's why you kind of have to do a little bit of research in your period to, to kind of settle in on your name. It took me a while to find a spelling of a name that was similar to Sophia that was used in my time period because um, names were, were <laughs> Ermagerd was a real name for my period. And I was really, really tempted to uh, register Ermagerd so that everybody go, Ermagerd! <laughs> but I was not that mean. Uh, <laughs> so I did find a name that was close to uh, Sophia, um, Suvia, and was able to register uh, my, my new name, which was not Ermagerd, even though I really, really wanted to so bad. Yeah, okay, confession time. <laughs> anyway, um, so you can register your name. And again, tons of information on this website. Um, let's see, I got one. Did I do that? Nope, I've already put that one in there. So that is pretty much what I have prepared. But what I wanted to do was kind of open this up for conversation and questions. So from somebody who hasn't spoken yet, have you kind of started looking at a time period? I always have questions. Oh, good. I like you. Ask me questions. In terms of being able to explore multiple cultures with the same persona. How far is too far when it comes to the contrived backstory about how you were born in France, but then your family moved to Egypt and the yada, yada, yada? Yeah, I mean, that's a difficult one to pull off in the medieval times because 90% of the populations they just didn't move. They just, they just didn't. Um, 
and and you could easily be born, live and die and and never go 20 20 miles from, you know, your your home area. Um, there were others that did travel. Um, if you wanted to do something like that, you might look actually at a Jewish persona because they were merchants and, um, and they did travel throughout history. Uh, you know, you might look, um, you know, uh, I see Laura's iPad. Laura was looking at the low countries um, in the Netherlands. You know, there was a lot of merchants um, in that area, in that time period, in that area. So that would be one way. Um, but, you know, if you want to do a convoluted persona, I mean, your persona story is only for you. Um, nobody's going to walk up and say, hi, this is my persona. <laughs> and this is my persona story. Um, and they're, you know, you're, they're not going to ask you about it. Uh, it's just kind of a, a, a grounding mechanism that you can use. Uh, and, you know, if you if it needs to be complicated, you can have it complicated. But what what are, what are you looking at doing? Um, I, I actually am pretty happy with my persona right now, as I'm doing UN Dynasty. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Um, Why are you would, going ooh at that? Yeah. Oh, I can't wait to see it. Big fan. Have the t-shirt. Yeah. I mean, you can, you have a lot of, you have a lot of access to silks there. Oh my God. Oh, I'm jealous. <laughs> um, you have all the silks. Come so, to you China. know, if we have pretty fabric. Yes. <laughs> Pet, pet, pet. <laughs> uh, but, you know, if you want to, instead of doing a convoluted story, develop an alternate persona. Um, you know, you don't have to have a French woman married to uh, a German man who is a traveler to the Middle East and, you know, and then went to the Americas and, and met a Native American and you don't have to have convoluted backstories. You can have separate personas and, and just draw from those. It, it's if you easy, have separate personas, pardon? how does that impact your word fame? Can you run into the situation where people think your body of work is insufficient because half of it is in one persona, half of it is in a different persona? No, not really. You know, like I said, you know, I started out in uh, 16th century Venetian. You know, if I wanted to, I could go back and and do research into uh, Veronica Franco and her body of work and her style of poetry. You know, and, because I want to. It's part of my old persona. Um, a persona is more a personal story you tell yourself to ground yourself. Right. I'm thinking of it more in terms of if you're introducing yourself by two different names at different events, are people going to realize they're actually the same person? So what I recommend is you pick a single name and you stay with that. Um, you know, if you want to change your name down the road, that's fine, but you really only go by one name. But if you want to um, investigate, you know, uh, like in my time period, uh, when I go look at the Sogdian Empire, um, I will still be Suvia. I may be dressing in Sogdian, or if I was to go do Scythian, which is another one that I'm really interested in, I would still be Suvia, but, you know, I would be um, able to just play in that. Like I said, a, a persona isn't a stricture. It's more of a personal story you tell yourself to give you focus. Um, you know, I will always be Suvia, um, even if I'm dressed in Anglo-Saxon, because um, that was that was contemporary with my time period. Or if I was dressed in Byzantine, early Byzantine, that's contemporary with my time period. Or I would still be Suvia if I dressed in 16th century Venetian. Um, nobody's going to quiz you on your persona. It's just a sort of a central internal organizing 
um, structure that that's that you use. Um, but it's it's kind of fun to you know talk about other people's personas. Um, does does anyone else have a persona that they want to share? Yeah, go ahead, Saba. I hope I don't rattle this too much. Um, <laughs> So my persona is um, the child of a, an Irish free farmer in uh, around 845 near where Dublin would be. Can you and hear? how does that influence um, your clothing? Well, I, um, that's where I focus most of my research. And so I, I really focus on that specific time period. Maybe I'll go further back, further forward to see where the fashion was going, where it came from, what the culture was like, um, who was interacting with whom, uh, that sort of thing. Do you ever dress in anything other than that time period? Oh, for sure. Yeah. So it's... This is a game. No one's quizzing you on it. Clovis, do you want to talk a little bit about your persona? I haven't dug too deep into uh, my persona, but uh, uh, so I'm Clovis D. Walton. So uh, Walton is a, a surname that is on my mom's side of the family, and it's a Saxon surname. So I picked uh, a 10th century Saxon for a persona. I don't know. I, I kind of got the the Clovis because a long time ago I was dating somebody who was into getting into Merovingian. So, you know, it, I, my my persona and name has changed over time. Yeah, and I, I can't believe you abandoned the Merovingians. We're just awesome. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, the name Clovis is very common throughout Europe. It's just a little bit different. Like uh, in high German, it's like Ludwig or Ludwiga would be a feminine of it. So, or like Lois. So, I mean, it it is, it's a pretty common name throughout most of them. I was just going to call on you, Eleanor. <laughs> okay. So I have a very uh, slightly like non-focused way of coming up with everything <laughs> about uh, the my persona, I guess you could say. So Eleanor came about because I wanted to be known as Eowyn and I couldn't document it. So Eleanor was the closest thing. And then um, Bolton is just a family name and easy to document because there's a castle and abbey and a town. And so that was easy to lock in. The day is because I started off as Norse because I love Leos and Pelissons and everything Norse. Oh uh, no, so Nor Norman. And then eventually I found out that I much prefer Code Hardies. And so I focus on like uh, late 14th century. So the late 1300s. And that kind of helps tie me. But I have explored so many very cultures and costumes in making clothing because that's something I really, really enjoy. And for a while I was really heavy into researching and training in various dance forms like Kothok, which is a North Indian and also Persian. So, and with all that, I just kept the same name. And that was just kind of like one of my side hobbies within the SCA and focus. So, but I've never really been persona driven, but it does give me that touch point. So like um, to kind of hang a few things on when I start into a new research rabbit hole. Yeah. And, and one of the reasons why I <clears throat> went from 16th century Venetian to Merovingian, um, other than I liked the challenge of it uh, is the clothes are much easier to sew and takes far less fabric. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, it, you know, it's as simple as that. So it, there's no rules around persona. It's, it's something that you use for yourself. It's, it's kind of fun to talk about your persona, like getting to know a person and their, and their interests uh, through their persona. Uh, but you're not required to have one, but just, just remember that if you don't pick a name, <laughs> it will be picked for you and it may not be something that you like. <laughs> so what I'm hearing is that if you want to do costuming on a budget, maybe you shouldn't go late period Venetian. Yeah. I mean, you can do it inexpensively, but it 
takes a lot of fabric um, and uh, yeah, takes a lot of fabric. Um, Merovingian clothing, you know, is fairly basic. Um, it, the, they did have silk. Um, one of the famous um, pieces, garments, hold on. Are the folks with their hands up wanting to chime in or have questions? Yep. So go ahead and I'll show you this here in a sec. But Esther, do you want to go ahead? Yes. Um, I've been in the SEA uh, since the mid 80s and I've been in three kingdoms and I've, I've gone through a couple of names and now I'm finally home in Ontier and I have settled on uh, Emma Haldane because I want to do what I call a, a generational persona. So the actual start for her is the you know, uh, the Daubigny in the early uh, Romano British, and then I can I can. Emma doesn't quite fit that period, but it fits everything else. And the main main persona I'm currently doing is, um, and I'm working on is um, sixth century Kent. So lots of Merovingian and Frankish and uh, Byzantine influence, but I can go all the way up to 1450, which is about where my interest sort of goes, stops. Um, same name, carrying on the persona of the family, you know, um, all the way through, uh, if I want to, to suit clothing, circumstances, et cetera, et cetera. So that's another way to do it without trying to have everything happen, you know. And then the doctor showed up and I got in the TARDIS and wound up in, you know, Florence in in the, the time of the Medici so yeah, that's, that's just a, a different approach yeah no that's that's a really good point um and I've thought thought about doing sort of the same um you know so the name Suvia Sophia Sophia is real common throughout you know that time period or throughout that region over time um and and so I thought about doing 12th century French um and then kind of moving forward through Baron and and those. So Siobhan, you had a question or comment? Yeah, I finally figured out how to unmute. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. I've been known as Siobhan ever since I started back in 2001, when people would call me by Siobhan instead of by my mundane nickname, Mercy. But there are so many Siobhans in Ontier. And I've been wondering if maybe I should change my name and pick something else. Yeah, what, what kind of cultures are you interested in? I'm 1098 Irish. Ooh. Sava? <laughs> Sava might be able to help you there. I've gone by uh, Siobhan Perch Deirdre and I wanted to change it to Siobhan Van Deirdre. Um, I had played with another group and the Furch was su suggested to me because the lady I was talking to was Welsh. And of course, Siobhan Furch Deirdre, Siobhan daughter of Deirdre, but in Irish, it would be Van, B-A-N, Siobhan Van Deirdre. But like I said, I'm, I'm thinking about changing the Siobhan, my um, mundane name is Marcelie, and there is in the Irish Book of Names, um, a similar name to mine. Marcella is there. Uh, I don't know. Suggestions? So um, conventionally, the, uh, the so-and-so daughter of so-and-so in, in Irish is, um, is usually interpreted as so-and-so ingen so-and-so. I went a different direction and I just gave myself a nickname. Um, so my full name is Savanita, uh, which is Sav of the Wood or Sav of the Forest. I didn't really have any uh, parental names that, that resonated in their translated forms. And so I went with that instead. Um, I'm not familiar with the Ban uh name uh convention but that does not mean that i can't learn 
it's in the Irish Book of Names. Um, my daughter Ellie is has had the same problem with one of the names that she wanted to submit because they're going, ah, oh, we've never heard of that. And it's in the same book. So um, she's still talking to them about that. Um, going by a nickname, that's an idea because I have been looking through there at different place names. My persona is from the Northern shore of the Shannon where it kind of goes up into a big bay on the left end of that, there are some islands that barely stick out into the channel, the largest of which is called Deer Island. It's about a mile long. And my persona's family maintained uh, a lookout there for um, King Brian's, uh, my grandfather was in his time. King and Brian so our family has served his family for a long time. My persona is currently in exile in on pier waiting for O'Connor and uh, Brian's grandson to finish fighting and determine who's going to be high king. I don't know yet, but it's going to be O'Connor who ends up being high king. But yeah, I'm kind of over here hanging out until hopefully... Brian's grandson wins and then sends me my father's ring to know that it's so I'll know it's time to go home and marry one of his guys so he can claim my family's lands. But um, because of that, I don't have to dress in the Irish of the time. I'm basically dressing in the English of the time, uh, which is 11th century. But yeah, I'll, I'll think about the nickname from the place because I am in hiding so going by a nickname would be a very good idea because that way O'Connor's men couldn't find me so thank you thank you I just like to chime in and say don't let other people's name limit what name you want to be called there is a ton of Eleanor's out there and all sorts of different spellings of it I just went with the common one and eventually you know you do either pick up yet another nickname or you, you know, tack on your last name or, you know, some other thing that differentiates you. But I mean, if you really like the name, then go for it, run with it. And yeah. Because that's what they did in period. I mean, you know, how many Eleanors are in period? How many Emmas are in period? You know, and you, you're in a community and the community gives identifiers and you give identifiers and it's all golden. Yeah, and the, the key thing is just have fun with it. Um, one of the other reasons why I, I picked my time period um, is that I could import gorgeous things. And one of the, the treasures of my culture is a garment that was found on a queen. And this um, couched cuff was part of it. So Part of the reason why I chose this culture is I can do awesome handwork like this laid gold work or tablet weaving or embroidery. Um, and they use a lot of garnets. I like garnets. Uh, so while I can also use a lot of the Roman stuff, I have the whole Germanic tradition of the time period of migration period that I can also choose from. So you know, the world's your oyster when you're picking out your per, your persona. And that's, that's pretty much what I have. We're going on about an hour. Do you have any recommendations for people um, researching, uh, doing persona research in non-traditional areas like uh, either Africa or, you know, some of the Asian countries that we haven't really touched? Yeah, so kind of the same, the same resources, you know, start, start with some of the, the um, same resources. When you're, when you're starting to look at Africa, boy, boy, you got some wonderful cultures that, that go back so deep um, into history that you can play with. 
when when you're starting to get more deep into that, um, I would reach out to uh, scholars, quite honestly, and uh, find scholars who are researching that. And you can find that um, using Google Scholar, find out who's writing papers on it and reach out to them and ask. That's one thing you're gonna find is that if you have a deep interest in a subject and you reach out to um, authors and researchers and scientists that are doing studies in that, they will totally love to help you out. Sava, you had a... Yeah, I just wanted to say that um, in terms of a lot of those non-European personas, there, there are groups popping up that are doing a lot of work on that. I know that uh, there was a shire in New York State that recently held a weekend symposium on indigenous American personas. Yeah. And they're, they're out there. And please week, look for them, connect to them. Next weekend, we're hosting uh, the organizer of that symposium is doing a Central Mexico uh, persona class. So, oh, that'd be interesting. Who actually is doing research for an Asian persona? Academia.edu is your friend. Thank more you. More and more of the existing research is being translated into English. Um, for instance, <clears throat> a lot of the <clears throat> really good Mongol costume research has been done by Olga Orfinskaya, who previously published entirely in Russian, but a lot of her papers have been getting English translations posted lately. And frankly, it's hilarious because most of her papers are, you know, analyzing the such and so burial at such and so archeological site, but there's one that is like, I don't recall what the actual title is, but it should be summarized as, why my colleagues are idiots who don't know what they're talking about. <laughs> and she basically goes through three case studies of archeologists who horribly misidentified pieces of garments because they didn't understand about how things were actually worn. For instance, there were some boot cuffs that were misidentified as an applique at the hem of the pants. Yeah, and, and that's kind of the beauty of what we do. You know, what we do is, is oftentimes experimental archaeology. Um, when, we're, when we're trying to recreate a thing, there was a story recently of um, there was this Roman artifact that was like a, a hexagonal thing. It had little knobbly things on it and holes through it. And the researchers thought it was some sort of amulet or religious articles or something like that. And this, I don't know if she was Swedish grandmother looked at it and says, oh, that's for making socks. <laughs> it was a little knitting machine that you would make socks on. And, and it was ceremonial sock makers. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> it's truly really amazing how everything that the archeologists don't understand what it's for gets classified as ritual or religious or ceremonial in nature. There is one paper I've, I'm trying to track down by an optometrist, because in some of the early, um, I forget which dynasty burials, before my period, there are a lot of burials with lead eye shields over the face. And they basically look like sleep masks, except they're made out of lead. And some of them are solid, and some of them are pierced with pinholes. And the optometrist published a paper that basically said, so judging by the uh, diameter of the pinholes, these would actually work as pinhole glasses to correct vision. And that's something I am very interested in because I wear glasses. It would be really cool if there were actually a period alternative. Now I need to know about the solid ones. That I have no idea about. 
<laughs> like, like I said, I'm trying to find the paper. I have only found references to the paper in other papers so far. Well, if you have the citation, we can help you find it. Post out on the Terra Pomeria Library page and we can help you track that article down. We'll get our mm. sleuths on it. I don't have it offhand. I will have to track it down through a trail of Google, find this book, find the site to this paper, find the site to that paper, but I'll look into that. Thank you. Awesome, yeah. Um, so any last questions, thoughts, or comments? Can I just expand on the, the thing I said previously about uh, non-European personas? The, yeah. the thing that I really want to hammer home on that one is that um, the SCA may not have a whole lot of resources in like the, the traditional usual places where everyone says to go. But if you do want to do one of those, you are not alone and you do not have to reinvent the wheel, even if you might get a little discouraged. There's definitely a lot of support for it out there, whether or not people know the exact thing you're looking for. Yep. For instance, there are specialty groups on Facebook. Yep. I have a question though. Go ahead. Once you have decided on a culture, how do people narrow it down to, oh, I'm from this specific village in this year? You know, if, if you don't want to take it down to that level, you don't have to. I, I, I haven't. I, I do live sometimes in Paris, but I have an unnamed ambiguous villa that I spend time on. And I also have um, large farms where we raise linen that we sell, um, but I don't, I don't have a place for it. I know the region that it would have been in. So, you know, it's, you don't have to be, you know, pinpoint exact on the stuff. You can, you can wibbly wobbly it. Um, and, and that would be good enough unless, you know, your jam is getting down to that village and, and finding a map from that era and, you know, really getting down to that nitty gritty if that's what you want to do, boy, do that and then share the information with us because we will be happy to geek out on it with you. I was mostly being impressed and having my mind blown when Siobhan said that she had it down to on the banks of a specific river. <laughs> yeah, we, we could we could uh, we could actually be related. Uh, that's where my m modern fam well, not modern, but uh, blood family is from in that area. You know, an, another thing, when I first started um, back in the mid 80s, um, my persona was Danish Viking, but I lived in Ontier. And so the, the family, the Viking family that I was in back then, I was I was uh, Atain, should have been pronounced Adon, but none of us knew that back then, but Atain Carl's daughter. Um, and our family had, were basically, um, pagan viking cultured pagans and we had moved uh to escape quote-unquote religious persecution and so we came to Ontier, which is a secular state and so we you can do that and there are people who are born now i mean the society is 55 we're in our 56th year because we were born in the same year and um so there are like two generations who are like, oh, I'm not French. I'm Caid. I was born in Caid, you know, and, and so that there, there's room for that. And there's room for bringing your persona into the known world, you know, um, and the, the great, the great saving throw of the SDA is that we t treat time periods like they're places. No, that's a really good point. And, and I think I'll, I'll kind of use that to finish here with is that it can be as ambiguous as, yeah, I'm, I'm from Montier and you know, you're, you're just sort of a, 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 a Norse-ish sort of <laughs> persona, or you can dive right down into it um, like Siobhan has and know exactly which 
river and village um, on the River Shannon she's from, you know, that's great. That's, that's wonderful. It's, it's what you need, what you want um, out of this exercise. For me, it's a framework I can hang something on um, because I like doing the, the crafts and the skills from that era. And it was a challenge at the time I started because nothing was in English. So, you know, or you can get right down into the nitty gritty and, and point to the bank of the river that, you know, you're from in Ireland, which is awesome. Now I want to go to Ireland. <laughs> okay, I want to thank everyone for your time. Um, and uh, Clovis knows how to find me. I can be found in the library group for Terra Pomeria or in the Terra Pomeria group or um, lots of different ways. So if you have questions, feel free to reach out.